Most people, they want to make money online. It's the dream. But how the hell do you start? I hated making content. This is a snippet of a private 90 minute conversation that I had with Sam that he is happy for me to share online as long as you promise that you're going to take action. And in case you have no idea who I am, my name is Lauren Tickner and a ton of people were asking me how I got Sam Ovens to do a call with me because he stopped doing consulting a couple years ago. And it's because I made a post in the school community revealing how we generated 100k in cash collected within the first week of launching the Impact School community. It wasn't that crazy to me because I've scaled two of my own online coaching businesses to multiple seven figures per year. However, I I've been off the YouTube game for a little while now, which is why you may be seeing me for the first time here now. So make sure to hit subscribe because tons more stuff like this is coming. This is the official relaunch of my YouTube channel. So tell me who you want to see next. And now let's get into the interview of Sam. Sam Ovens, legend of the consulting industry. And you've made quite some shifts over the last few years. You are a very, very interesting guy. And I made a post saying that I was interviewing you and it just got dozens and dozens and dozens of comments and so so many people know who you are and they're interested by you probably from seeing your youtube videos when it comes to your mission now what would you say that is in a few words to help one billion people find community to you what does that entail it means like finding your people which is kind of the same thing as finding your thing i think everyone's looking for their purpose right like what is this thing that I can be good at? And then your peer group tends to form around that thing, like if you're lucky, right? And there's a whole community there. I grew up with the internet. I was fascinated with the internet. Um, the thing I loved about it is that I could search for like anything and find anything. And I always found these groups of people that would kind of form around an obscure interest or hobby. Like I used to build computers and things. And so I would go onto the forums and and meet all of these unique people there. And then when I was playing like Counter-Strike, I did the same thing again. Then when I did like go-kart racing and car racing, I did the same again. And ultimately that's what I did with entrepreneurship too. There was a community online. There's people who you can learn from. I just noticed this pattern of like over my life where you're trying to discover your thing and you're exploring, right? And part of discovering that is to find the different communities and to kind of see what they're like and see which ones you you kind of fit in with. The key really to learning and mastering everything I found is to find the community. Mm. Because once you have a friend, it's fun. And once it's fun, you'll do it every day. And then it's basically done, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's true. So it reminds me, I was trying to learn Spanish and I had a 666 day streak on Duolingo because it was gamified and because it was fun and people on the community were spurring you on. And I wasn't necessarily making as much progress as I would like because I was sat there in Spain trying to speak Spanish and I couldn't really say anything at all, but it made it enjoyable. And you're so right. And you mentioned there something relating to these are the people that you learn from and you found people on the internet. So who are those, some of those people for you that you would say had helped you when it comes to business um, nowadays? The first ever course I took that actually helped me start a business was from a guy called Dane Maxwell. Um, it was on how to start a software business. And without that, I would have never got into this. So that was definitely helpful. And then I would say most of my learning though has come just from like observation Um of the the great companies that I've used and seen growing up, which would be like Google, Facebook, and Amazon. So I've read everything about those companies and I've used them and I've been fascinated by them. Um, I've learned a lot from them. Um, and then, you know, it depends, like if we're talking specific things, like how to do, at a certain point in my life, I needed to know how to do Facebook ads. And so there was a guy I learned from called Jason Horning, who was very good at that. He's great. And yeah. so, yeah, there's, there's specific things where I've found someone that, you know, if I need to learn a thing, I'll find who who is the best person at this. I'll learn from them, right? Um, But in terms of just general, like, that I get to apply almost every day, it would just be observing those great companies. In order to do that, how do you go about finding that information? You're Googling it. Are you also investing in the companies to unlock information that other people might not otherwise have if it's a private company as an example or what's your strategy typically for that I learned that it wasn't really a strategy it was more of a a passion 
right? Mm -hmm. So I was following like, I mean, Google unlocked the internet for me because before Google, I would actually have to exchange, I'd call friends and ask for cool websites and write them down in a notebook, right? So I, there was no search engines before Google. And I used the internet for many years before that, before Google, right? So Google like unlocked the internet for me and I used it, I've used it for hours every day in my life for like, I think Google's 25 years now, old now. So I've used Google daily for hours for 25 years. So it's been very close to me and I've just been fascinated by it. So as a user of it, right? Like that's how I learned a lot, just watching it kind of evolve over the years. And then also reading the letters to shareholders that gets you a another perspective of it because you get to see it from what happened inside. And then you can relate to like, you go back to the first ever letters to shareholders 25 years ago, you hear what's going on internally and then you remember you were experiencing that on the other side. And that's quite cool. I did the same thing with Amazon um facebook too like do you remember using facebook when you were when you were at school oh yeah i had to lie about my age to make an account and it made my facebook account get banned a couple of years ago right when we were, <laughs> were doing some campaigns so it's more just i've been really passionate about the internet like and these are some of the main things that that changed the way i use the internet and and so it's been more of a passion. And then I learned that those were, they turned out to be some of the best businesses in the world, right? And so the thing I cared about what, and the thing that I used was turned out to be very important. Um, and I ended up in business. And so just a lot of those things that came intuitively to me were like, I never knew I was really learning them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right, because the learning was just a byproduct of you just doing the things that you were interested in anyway. And that is naturally when you typically excel in something because you're good at it or you have interest in it anyway. So then you're just going to be more inclined to do more of that thing. People don't know how to learn, right? And so they kind of try and fight, figure some stuff out, but they don't have an approach which is successful for them to learn things specifically, which prevents them from achieving their goals you know there's infinite things to learn right so there's a problem with learning and so my first inst my first instinct is to really be like do i really need to learn that and try not to right like because you can't learn everything and you quickly run out of time i don't try to learn i try to wait until there's a real problem and and then I figure out like what would be the best solution. And so I'm more trying to like solve a problem. I never think like, oh, how can I learn something? I, I'm just trying to solve a problem. You know, in my, when I was younger, I would try to like see if there was articles on it or something like that, right? But they, they tend to be pretty bad. I don't know if you've tried just Googling things. You get medium articles, you get like affiliate things, you get just junk. It leads to you just like doing what other people think. Um which means you're not even really like thinking for yourself. So these days I try to like not search for, for the answer and just try to like figure out like what, what I should do um, and, and try to do that more, which has been very helpful. And I think that's what most people are missing, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the time, like what will come intuitively to you might not be in an article, and it might be way better than anything you find in an article, right? Mm -hmm. And it leads to innovation and creativity. So, you know, there's there's that. And then you learn through the experience of, of application. That's another thing people have forgotten about with the internet is that, you know, you learn the most by doing, not by like looking at some articles. I don't consider that reading. Um, I mean, sorry, I don't consider that learning really. Um, I consider that just reading. Um, so, you know, you try to figure out what's the problem. You try to like, like figure out how you would solve it yourself. And then you try it and you see what happened and you, you iterate, right. And you, and you're learning through the experience of problem solving. The other one will be like, I will find out well, who has experienced this problem, like who's, who's experienced this problem and solved it. Right. 
and then I'll just think through who and then I'll contact them. Um, and if I can't think who, I'll ask people who might be close to people who have experienced it and I'll ask them to connect me, right? Yeah. Um, so finding the people is key, not the articles, right? Um, because it really, if you think about it, learning is just like solving a problem and yeah. it comes from experience. And so, and the people that solve the problem and experience the solving of the problem are people. So it's generally like, you just think of those core like things, like what is the problem? Who has it solved it and experienced it? And like who? And then just go to the people. Um, but if you're not so connected and stuff, it, it like if you're starting out, right? And if you're, when you're also starting out, you don't really trust your own problem solving abilities much. So I get it a lot, like most of the market probably wants a template. That's where I think you just find the community and ask them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's communities that surround almost everything, right? And, and it's generally pretty easy to find the community, right? Like if you want to do a funnel, you can find like a funnel community, like whatever. Um, and you can also find the events like digital marketing. You could find it, an event. Those are very useful too, because you're getting into the community. And then you just, you just tell people like your problem and see if they, they know how to solve it. And you'll be shocked. Like in one lunch break at an event in like within an hour, you will have been connected to like four people that have experienced the exact problem and already know the answer. And if you were, if you were at home Googling stuff and reading Medium articles, you might be lost for a year. Yes, yes, yes. So speaking of events, um, what's your take on running communities online versus in person or the blend between the two? Because, of course, now you are the founder of School, which is an incredible membership platform. I'm an affiliate for it. I've, I'm mobilizing a lot of our clients on there. We're really enjoying using it ourselves for our own community. It's not been long, but we've been loving using it so far. And I think the online experience is fantastic. And I do still believe that the in-person element, like you just kind of alluded to, is 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 critical. So how do you typically think through the balance of that when trying to build a sustainable community um, for your business? The community I ran for the longest that was very tight and it was like, it was called Quantum Mastermind, right? And it was like 36 grand a year. There was a hundred people in it. I just kept it at a hundred, right? So it made like 3.6 mil a year. It's extremely profitable. There wouldn't have even been a hundred grand of expense. Wow. In that. And it was the most effortless thing to run and it was fun. And I knew everyone personally. So like, was like hanging out with friends, right? Um, and the structure of it, I got to iterate the structure of it because I ran it for seven years. Um, and some people were in there for all seven years. It was so nice to run because it contained no course content. I never had to make any content. All I did was like help people solve their problems. And all of us were experiencing the same problems. And I was like and so i would crowd we would crowdsource solutions basically right and the structure of it was very simple we had a two hour q a call every week on zoom where people would just show up and ask questions right i would answer them if i knew and if i didn't i'd say does anyone else know and someone else might jump in right and then uh, over a bit of time, we learned out oh, who were the different experts and different things. Like, oh, this guy knows YouTube ads. This guy knows sales calls. This guy knows tax, right? And so we would it would kind of work quite nicely. Um, but we also did uh, four events a year. They went for three days each. And two were in person and two were virtual. Mm. And those in-person events were key. Like the mastermind would have not been the same without those because you realize that's when everyone gets really close because they get to like meet each other and hang out and like joke around and and things like that and then that that translates over to the community afterwards you notice so like on the q a calls everyone's happier and joking with each other because they they know who each person is 
Right. Same thing in the digital community. They will also joke with each other because they, it's not just a little circle <laughs> profile picture anymore, right? They know who that person is. We had more customers outside of America than in America, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They came, like a lot of them came, not everyone all the time. We, we had about an 80% show up rate. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So that that's what I'd recommend if, you have a paid small community, there's like, you'll find that it just gets so much tighter after that. Um, mm -hmm. And people will stay for longer and, and all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, also the, the, the things you can get from that are, are really good too. Like you can get uh, photos and you can record it and, and that gives you amazing material to promote it. Because we found that when you're promoting something, when people can see that it's physical and they'll get to be somewhere, it's way easier for them to to imagine what they're purchasing, right? Right. That makes sense, yeah. And, uh, of course, if you wanted to sell that stuff or give it away for free and put it all on YouTube, for example, it's great, it's the best content possible. Speaking of in-person versus paid, what are you seeing right now is is helping people build the most sustainable businesses when it comes to your users on school? We don't have all the data on this because we only rolled out our payments feature like through True. where you can now like charge for membership on school using school's own payment system, right? So the majority of people on school are actually using payments off platform. So they'll be using something like Samcart, Thrivecart, whatever, right? Um, so we don't actually have much visibility into that at all. Uh, and, you know, we have this like, you know, school, the market, and I'm sure you're aware of this because you've been in the same market as me. It used, courses used to be one time, right? You'd just sell a course and people would get access, one time payment. And then there was the high ticket world, which is still really just one time, but they might break up the payments. The only real thing that I noticed that was recurring might have been a mastermind, right? Um, but the majority of the industry was not selling like recurring membership, right? Yeah. You know, we had to kind of meet the market where it was, right, with school initially. Um so I would say the majority of people on school aren't actually charging a monthly membership and they're also not using school payments. Hmm. So, but that all changed three weeks ago, right? So now more and more people are, are thinking of charging monthly for membership, which emphasizes the community more than the content, right? Mm -hmm. Um and they're using school payments. That makes sense. It's interesting because I must have tested every possible platform <laughs> that there is. And the reason why we chose school is exactly for that reason, because we see the shift in the industry going from those upfront payments towards the monthly recurring. But the mistake that we made was fascinating because after... I made a post in the school community revealing how we generated 100k in cash collected from the launch of our community and that's what initiated the conversations with SAP. Since then my team and I have been doing private calls for people who sign up to school using our affiliate link. So if you'd like to do that and join in on those mastermind sessions, there's a link in the description box where you can jump into school on a free trial. And if you like it and you become a paying member, we will invite you to those calls as a gift to you for using our affiliate link. Every single person had bought and I made a post about this in school that you your team shared via your email list so thank you for the shout out but um we were able to have a very very successful launch but then right after that when we surveyed everyone we actually realized that the reason why they were buying was different from our hypothesis and our hypothesis was that we thought that they wanted a membership like a mastermind type of model when really they just wanted what we were always selling but they liked this model that they would get to connect with other people as like a bonus so since we've done that survey, we shifted back to our other marketing message, but more so highlight the community element as a natural byproduct of their journey with us and as a way to make it more engaging and enjoyable. So that was pretty fascinating. But before we move off of the topic of payments, I have to ask you this. What are you guys doing to prevent the risk that so many people are facing right now of the 
dreaded payment processor holding the funds or banning the account. School are the merchant, right? Mm -hmm. So then we let everyone else use us, right? So essentially we assume the risk mm -hmm. and the payment process is like that a lot more because you know, they don't have to worry about all of these different people. They just worry about one person or right. one platform, right? Like us. Um, and so it's really what the platforms, what, like the big processes prefer is this type of relationship because mm -hmm. um, they just have one point of contact instead of like thousands. Yeah. Um, and so it changes things a bit. Um, and then we have more visibility into like, bad behavior um you know if if someone if a merchant starts up on like stripe and they they're being naughty like stripe can't really see much right they just see some it looks like fraud right and they kind of panic but with us because we're the platform like we can tell hey is this user done sketchy stuff elsewhere and we can see like the products that people are purchasing who sold the product and so it's way harder to do, to be naughty, basically. Um, and because of all of that, it just changes things, basically. That makes so much sense. Yeah, I mean, whenever, for example, somebody has a dispute with a payment processor, you have to go back through and check the, you know, the tracking, has the has the client who's made the refund actually logged in? Did they sign an agreement? Da, da, da. Whereas if everything's done through school, you guys have all that data right there. And that ultimately can either allow you to just ban that person from using school if they really are doing something sketchy or fight for their case if, if not. So I really like that. And I think it's a great a great move that you guys are making and it definitely makes me feel relieved because we have a ton of different processes all the time because you never know when they can just click their fingers and switch just because one client did one ch chargeback or something <laughs> so um with that said so one of the questions that my coaching team wanted me to ask you because we have a ton of customers who are moving into this model that you just mentioned, which is moving away from selling a high ticket package, one off, which typically has a retention offer on the back end. They are shifting towards selling a membership from on the front end and they want this to be their primary model, potentially not as high ticket over the first three months, but it comes out to just as much price as it would have over the year, right? So the price is just kind of paid out over 12 months rather than upfront or over three. And so for someone to be really successful with a membership, with the data that you've got thus far, what have you seen to be some of the actions that they take in order to retain their customers and have a successful community? Yeah. Well, this is all, this all gets really interesting, right? Because it's a very different business model. And so the the tactics and everything are very different. Mm -hmm. um, I would say one of the biggest things that leads to retention is how low the price is, obviously, mm -hmm. right? Having to pay a very high price every month is, it always has you questioning, right? Um, so having a lower upfront price, it changes the economics because your conversion rates go up because it's way easier to sell, right? You don't need VSLs and funnels or anything. You can just like go straight to the page where they buy, which is great. And then retention is higher. So it changes the economics of everything, right? Um, so that's it. That's from a pricing perspective. From a retention from like a content perspective, I think the biggest thing for retention would be like just a, a call schedule. So one guy runs a community on school that's very successful, makes like 200 grand a month. He just does a daily coffee call. He calls it like coffee hour. So he just like wakes up, jumps on Zoom and just has a coffee with his community and they just hang out. Um. There's no scripting or anything like his audience and, and customers. They just want to be, they just want to hang out with him. They just want to be with him and they're not going to get that experience anywhere else. Not on his YouTube, not on his email list, not in his courses. Right. Mm -hmm. 
that one's quite shocking really like it's so easy for people to do right and it's actually what they consider to be most valuable um he also organizes like hikes every now and then so they people just come together and they go on a hike um and so he, he's really trying to build like a, a true community right and he's always seeing what his community needs. Like at first he was helping them with fitness and diet and dating. And then a lot of them said they wanted to make money. So he started teaching them different ways that they could make money. And it's just an evolving thing over time. Instead of what tends to happen with a course is something very specific. Like I will show you how to do this. And it's very specific to that and it's static. So it can't move, right? And once the content's created, it's just done. And like, whereas a community is more of a a living thing. That's the mindset that a lot of people are in that that kind of is tricky. Um, course creator moving over thinks they just make content. So they're they're always worried about the content. Like, why would someone keep paying when they can get my content, right? That's true. If you just put the same content in the community and charge a subscription price, yeah, that's a legit fear. Um, and then like people from social media, they're so used to just making content. Like they just make a video and release it and they make a post and release it, right? Whereas a community is more of a two-way conversation. And it's more of a living thing. Um, and the people that get that, they always build really good communities. Um, and just thinking, another good thing to think about is how can I get all of the members in my community to like, to connect with each other? The stronger the relationships of the one-to-one -one connections, the stronger the, the aggregate at the community level, right? That's and so these things you can... There's things you can do, like a really simple post that you can have in your community pinned at the top when you start it is, um, is introduce yourself and share a photo of your like your desk, right? And so you you give people a template of how to introduce themselves because otherwise they overthink it. And you say like, my name is this, I do this, and I'm from location. Very important. Location is key. For fun, I like to do three things, and right? And then they share a photo of their workspace. So what that does is it allows people to see who else is in the room, right? Or who else is in the community. And they will spot things. Every person has different kind of things that will, when they see them, will stand out to them and it helps a connection spark. So for a lot of people, that's going to be geography, right? Like, oh, you're also in Canada. Or it's probably more specific. It's like, oh, you're also in like um, Vancouver, because they they can now meet up with that person, and they've got they've got a they've got something in common, right? Um, or someone might be like, oh, you play golf for fun. I play golf too, right? The fun question is massively underrated. I even did it in my mastermind, and I swear people would talk would talk more about the things that people did for fun than the, than the business stuff, right? Everyone just wants to feel good and have fun yeah. more than everyone. Thinks. And then the workspace or the, the photo of the desk is another one because people, people express themselves in their space, right? And they might not do that that much in words when they, when they say who they are, but you know, if some, someone will probably have like a guitar next to their desk and then the people that play guitar will be like, oh, you've got one of these guitars. Do you play? And and now you've started that. Or they might notice that someone's in like, in a, they've got a gaming PC. So they know, oh, you're, you're a gamer. Like it's a giveaway about what kind of person they are, right? And so this really simple thing is massively underrated. This This will help it'll help people understand who else is here and it will spark connections between all of the different members. Yeah. Um, and it's really basic and everyone can participate in it because it's just so simple and they get to share about them instead of this one person just, you know, megaphoning to everyone. Right.
Mm -hmm. um, that's the paradigm shift people have to make when it comes to building a community is how do you get your members to connect with each other? And how do you get them to share things about themselves? Whereas when you're on social media, it's always just me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the only time you hear from other people is when they say how cool you are. Um, and so like, that's not a community. And a lot of people just think that that's what a community is when they move over. So they, what they'll do is they'll just post content mm. like daily, they'll make a schedule even. And it, man, these people, they, they even want um scheduled post feature, which is something I'm very reluctant to do because that's just one step further away from community, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Like they want to make a calendar, write the content and then schedule it and then not even show up. Like, mm -hmm. come on. But that's the mindset that came from social media. So yeah, there there is a little bit of a friction, I would say, with like this the influencers moving to community and then from course sellers moving to community. And then there's what I would call like just community natives in a way, which is like, it's what I'm finding more and more as I do this is that There is just this community is creating this new type of person on the internet, right? Just like social media stood out to people who who liked a certain thing. YouTube stood out to people who liked a certain thing. Community is is getting this new type of person to come up. And some people always felt a bit weird with the old model and this one fits better for them. Ultimately, it's about identity. And so if you've self-identified as a social media creator, it isn't just your actions like you don't you don't just have actions just because those actions have also become your identity same thing with being a course creator you want to have the best course content possible but with a community interestingly enough we found the same thing when we had surveyed ah uh, customers they love the short videos that are easy for them to watch these were their words but at the same time the thing that they say that they like the most is the calls and the interaction with the other people people finding friends is very complex and it can't be systemized really mm -hmm. like if you yeah, think true. about what's going on like someone sees that someone likes playing golf or that someone's in vancouver or someone has an electric guitar next to their desk or maybe there's just a certain aesthetic style to the way someone has like created their workstation that just someone knows that they're they're going to be friends with that person. Do you know what I mean? Totally. Yeah, this is such a good point, actually, because you mentioned you really enjoyed running Quantum as well. So what made you shift away from that? Like when it was really fun for you, is it like a bandwidth thing or was there something else? Yeah, I just like I would have kept doing Quantum if it was the best thing really but i i have school now right yeah, so okay. so it's focused yeah i i closed it and i refunded everybody because i need to focus on this that there's no room really for Makes anything sense. else yeah yeah because it may not even be a time thing it's like a mental energy because i feel like the energy that something can take in your mind is is sometimes more damaging than the time <laughs> i've noticed the same thing that people do every time right like when they charge higher ticket and they make something that is an event there everyone is like self-conscious in a way so mm -hmm. like they're going to they're going to add things to just to to think that it's worth it mm. right but a lot of those things are just totally unnecessary breaking people into subgroups having a facilitator like a board of advisors all of this stuff it's very like mechanical right mm -hmm. um and maybe that's what they want i don't know but what i found the main thing people want is they want to be in a group of people that are roughly at the same level as them experiencing the same things as them if they're in that room basically the solutions will come and you but too much structure kind of suffocates that mm -hmm. and this is another thing people have been guilty of in this industry for a while now is they don't actually run their events like or even their calls or anything like a true workshop or a collaboration right 
I always think with my stuff, like I show up empty. I have no agenda. I have planned nothing. Mm -hmm. I just know that by doing it and caring about it a lot, that I'll probably have answers to most questions, right? Yeah. Um, but that allows things to just kind of evolve naturally. And I kind of, at the start of the events, I go around the room and I get people to say where they are now, where they want to be and what's blocking them. So I identify this gap in what's blocking and I'm taking notes. And what I learn from that is so everyone gets to like know who else is here, right? Um, but I also learn like what people need from the event instead of me trying to sit down, like killing myself, trying to make keynote slides for days, trying to imagine what all of these people want, right? Which is, you can never do a very good job like that. Um, and then I let that kind of, I create the structure of the three days live with them. And then kind of when we get to each topic, I'm like, okay, so what do, what does everyone want to know about this? Mm. and then I write write it down on the whiteboard and then we go through each one and address them and if I know an answer I'll 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 answer it and if I don't I'll see if anyone else in the room has an answer to the specific thing and then we'll exhaust a topic until everyone in the room is happy like yeah that we're all good on this now then we move on to the next topic repeat the same thing again right mm -hmm. do you yeah. see how it's like crowdsourcing and collaborating the opposite of that is what I've seen people do is like they'll hold a mastermind and then people come and they've just got speakers, <laughs> like yeah. external speakers that, that, that have already prepared their PowerPoint or whatever. And they come up and they literally just talk at the audience. Mm -hmm. And it's not two way at all by the fact that they're on a stage. There's a, audio visual system and the audience is down there right mm. so there's no two-way thing um and so people just sit there and just get like fed content for for a few days that is and then they leave which is that's not what i think you should do like i think you should you should there should be like a a real back and forward kind of like dynamic does that make sense yeah, it makes total sense. When you leave those events as well, that you just feel like your brain is overloaded and you're slacking your team with all these ideas and then your team is so stressed because now you have 10 different strategies to implement and everyone's feeling crazy. <laughs> it makes me feel stressed when I think about it. But what you say is when I think back to all the events that I've been to that have been amazing masterminds and I've taken so much, they've been they've done it in that same approach. And I think it comes down to sometimes the concept of watch what, people are doing not necessarily always just what they're saying so when you go to an amazing event that you love for everyone listening what were the things that were, were actually going on at that event that allowed you to take so much away from it so we've discussed having a fluid and a real true community type of dynamic within your membership but when it comes to like the operational back end okay for example, things like, I'll tell you some things that me and my team have been discussing lately. Maybe you can just tell me I'm totally off track and this is not something that I should be focusing on. But I got some people on my ops team focusing towards like cancellation funnels, right? So if a member wants to cancel, what is our approach? How, what are we going to do? What are we going to give bonuses? Are we going, like, I'll get them on the phone, feedback, et cetera. Um, we're also thinking through other things such as if, people are not showing up, you know, outreach strategies to pull them back in, etc. So what's your thought process on, I don't want to say forcing re-engagement, but it really is sometimes people genuinely do get busy in their lives. And I feel they need to kind of be pulled back in. What do you think about that? There's something about like being in a community where you know the faces are going to be the same for a year. Mm. When, when they're always, when there's always new faces coming and going, it's like, trying to build a community in a hotel mm, mm -hmm. yeah right everyone's coming and going or like in an airbnb town you'll notice airbnb towns have poor communities not not poor financially but just the, there's no sense of community because everyone is a visitor it's just like dubai right? yeah yeah we places where people own like neighborhoods where there's high ownership 
mm-hmm. there's much stronger sense of community because everyone has is there and they know they're going to keep being there right um so that that will definitely change the the nature of in the dynamics of your community um and then you know that you don't need any cancellation thing like that's already because cancel policy has been handled up front right Mm -hmm. yeah so you don't need any funnel or anything like that it's just done with regards to your perspective if you were going to be launching something yourself right let's say you were just a user on school and you needed to launch something in the next one to three months what type of model would you go for mastermind or more of a lower ticket community yeah so mastermind is is a really cool model but it can only really be done by the by a small percentage of the market right because and and it's typical like the typical evolution i've seen with people in this space is that they will often do some at first they'll do something as a service or whatever like actually doing it for people and then they will make a course right and then that course might evolve to be more of a high ticket coaching hybrid thing so it's like course plus q and a calls right and then then the natural progression from there is to add a mastermind on the back end right yeah and so really someone's had to evolve through that you can't go from like nothing to mastermind right because who's gonna pay to join um so you know masterminds are great for people who have are ready for that next step right they've already got a lot of customers like how many customers did you have before you made your mastermind yeah i mean it's been thousands yeah See, so there's only a small percentage of people who are going to be ready for that. Um, so I think that just basically removes most people. Um, so then how would you make a, a membership community then? Which is, it's like a mastermind, but it's for more people at a lower price and it is monthly subscription, right? Is that really the, the question? Yeah, I mean, the question, yeah, that that could be part of the question. The question was more so what you would do, because I think you have so much data to be able to decide. So given you are highly unusual, like compared to your audience, right? So my audience are people who in their industry, they're kind of OGs, you know, they're pretty solid within their space. So I understand that maybe they're not not beginning. They they are advanced. Is that what you're saying? They're well known in their own industry, but in the internet they are not well known there's two kind of paths depending on like how confident you are that if you can sell something if you're confident that you can sell something and charge for membership just go straight to that Mm -hmm. i would just make a low ticket community that's going to be you know somewhere in between like five bucks and probably 200 bucks right but most will probably be under 100 bucks and put it puts like a, a course in there it doesn't have to be overkill like just a just a small course so there's immediate value the moment someone joins come up with a call schedule like an ama or a q a or a coffee hour whatever you want to call it it doesn't need to be like premeditated content it can literally just be show up and let's hang out and then you can record those calls and post them in the recording so you're starting to like build content into this community right So I'd add a little course that is kind of like instructions for what people should do when they join. Mm -hmm. And then I would come up with a call schedule. Then I would do that introduce yourself post, right? Those would be the three things I do first. Then I would invite my most engaged 10 customers first before announcing it to the public at all, right? Because you, if you just go zero to a hundred with a community, like everyone joins and there's nothing there and everyone has the same first impression, which is there's nothing here. <laughs> so that's like not good. Right. Um, so you, you just reach out to your 10 most engaged people, like 10 most engaged customers and invite them and get them to join. Right. And then you just hang out with them. So you get the first few calls going in the recordings. You get their feedback on the content. You get them to start engaging in the community and introducing themselves and all of that, right? 
And then once you've got a good kind of base thing there, which could be done in like two weeks, right? Mm. The setup time I'm talking here is, is less than two weeks. That you don't need to make much of a course when you're selling a community. You just think of the course as minimal, minimum instructions for for like application, right? Um, so people need to be told, what do you do? Like, hey, you should do this thing and then let's collaborate on how everyone's doing it in the community and on the calls. Once I've got like, you know, a group of 10, five, 10 people in there and it's it's going well, that's when I would start promoting it publicly. So you could do like a, a little launch around it, like you could build up to it and then open it for so many days and for people to join. Um, and then you could increase the price after that to create like an urgency kind of push. Yeah. Um, and then you get a bunch of people in and then you stabilize the group again, right? And then you do another push. Um, that's probably what I would do. I'd probably cycle my like pushes like so that I'm not promoting all the time. I get to just kind of focus on stabilizing, promoting, stabilizing, promoting instead of being constantly promoting, constantly stabilizing. Um, that's how I would get started if I knew I could sell something, which is, yeah. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. And if you couldn't sell something? Yeah. So this is where community is great. I think it's probably like, it, this is the, it's biggest benefit, I think, to people in this industry. So most people, they want to make money online, right? They want to. They want to make money doing what they love. Like, who wouldn't want that? It's the dream. But how the hell do you start? Like, how do you go from not having a list, an audience, or even a niche and any customers to, like, creating a course that costs $500 and launching it and, and expecting sales, right? I think that's where everyone gets stuck. And then what do you even teach in this course? Because you don't even really know what you're doing and how we, then you have all of these like very natural kind of reactions. Like why me? Like, am I like a fraud doing this? Which is very natural because you're saying you're, you have to pretend you're the expert in order for people to think of buying and, and it's just weird. So it feels all wrong. You could create a free community, right? And at first, you're just trying to get some people that care about this topic. So you basically try to figure out what is this thing I care a lot about, right? At least say it's horse riding or something. I don't know. Whatever your thing is that you love. And then you make a community on it and it could be free. And it's just for people that are passionate about this thing that you're passionate about. And then you try to get people to, to, to join, basically. Like you might you know, post on social media, you might find some Reddit threads where your community, find out where these people are and try to like join the conversation that's going on and then try to like somehow naturally weave in this thing you're doing. Mm. You could also try running some ads. Just getting someone to join for free is a great first step, actually. Like, I don't know if you remember your first opt-in. Best feeling. It feels, it feels like you can do something. It's not money, but you're still stoked because something happened, right? Mm -hmm. And so just getting someone to join for free is a great first step. And then you, but what's better about a community is you can actually talk to this person, which you can't do with an opt-in. They're a person, there's a face, right? You can communicate. Yeah. And so you're just trying to connect with these people and see and together figure out what problems everyone has and how you can crowdsource the solutions. So you you don't have to be the expert initially. You really are just the organizer, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're gathering all of these people together and you're collaborating with people to figure out what everyone needs. And then you're finding people who might have the solutions and you're crowdsourcing the content. And it's kind of starting to form in posts. And then you might take the best of that and add it as a classroom module. And then naturally, quite quickly, I think you'll find that the, you figure out what the niche is. You figure out the messaging that's necessary to get those people to join something. 
and the channels, right? And then you figure out what their problem is and then you figure out what solutions they're interested in and you get to form your minimum viable product essentially. Mm -hmm. And you, and people, when people start to have some wins, like they're starting to solve the problems that they said they had, right? And they're, they're starting to, to love this experience. That's when you know you have like the basically the the germ for like the the organism. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And that's when that's when all you need to do next is literally just charge for it. And maybe you grandfather the existing members in because they helped you form it, right? So they don't have to pay. Or maybe they get a discounted rate. I don't know, whatever. But then from that moment on, you can charge a price and you can start with a lower price and you can start working your price up as you gain more confidence in yourself. And you'll gain more confidence in yourself as your community succeeds more. Yeah, so yeah. true. I love that. That is so, honestly, that is a absolute playbook right there. That's, that is so good, Sam. So thank you so much for sharing that. I love the concept of running it for free, getting it so engaged and then putting a price tag on and potentially grandfathering. Maybe you take like the leaderboard. I love that leaderboard feature you have in school. It's so we've done a ton of prizes, people that have been on there and it keeps people coming back and maybe they could be grandfathered in and get some bonuses. That That is so good. So I'm very conscious of the time and I, I appreciate um, these few extra minutes we have here. I do have I do have a question from the audience though that I'm, I'm going to have to ask because this one has been one that's been on my mind too. And um, so the question was from Miles Stutz and it says, and, and a lot of people replied to this comment, like liking it, right? And saying, I'm interested in knowing this answer too. So I had to ask, it says, curious to know about Sam's inner transformation and reasons going from, this is his words, not mine, robo Sam <laughs> to laid back Sam. So please tell us. I just shouldn't make videos, to be honest. Like, I, I, um, I hated making content and I was always in a great, I dreaded it if it was on my calendar. And if you look at my like track record, I was the most inconsistent person ever. I, my schedule was basically, I'll make a video when I feel like it, um, mm -hmm. which was basically never, or I could force it to happen, but I was in a great deal of pain. And I think what I, what I came to understand is that what you feel when you make the video will often be what the viewer feels when they watch it, right? And I never, most of the time I didn't feel very good. And so I was, it was very strained. And um, I remember reading a comment once and this guy said, man, it looks like this guy is being held at gunpoint to make this video and i was thinking yeah that's literally what i felt like um wow and, and so that led to this freezing up and like very roboticness because it's not natural for me to just talk to a camera too right no. i have no problem talking to a person like you because we have it's going both ways right um but i just yeah i'm not I re I came to understand that I'm not, that's not what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Like that wasn't natural for me. You take someone else like Alex Hormozy, for example, he loves it. He's so good at it. It's so natural. So he's just like skyrocketing there, right? Whereas someone like me is best for behind the scenes working on a system, right? Um, and so I guess when that when my life changed to be more aligned to my personality, I also just became more happy and relaxed. That's awesome. Yeah. And That's I didn't have to, and I wasn't showing up any I just deleted all my social media too. I don't have anything. Um and so I just got to do the thing that I loved. And yeah. That's amazing. That's such a insightful answer too, because I would never have thought that you hated creating content because your thoughts when articulated and, and when, or when put out there, sorry, are very, very powerful and helpful for others. But it makes sense that you say that because you said that you like the 
interaction and that's also just like your mission towards helping people find their community right which is what you're doing through school and so through having conversations that's another way of kind of building a bond with someone having a back and forth just like in the community so I love it and Sam this has been so amazing it's been super helpful for me as well so thanks so much for doing this interview and um obviously well you know everyone's gonna go check out school I'm gonna put some snippets in the middle so people can go use my affiliate link because I want to get to the top of that leaderboard over the next few months that's my goal <laughs> cool. so I'll see you there but they shouldn't follow you they should just go to school and sign up right with my affiliate link that's all that's all yeah Awesome. Sam, thank you so much. This was great. If you'd be interested in learning more about exactly how we use organic social media to scale coaching businesses, I'll drop a link in the description box where you can find a video that explains exactly how it all works. Plenty more interviews like this coming, so make sure to hit subscribe. This is the return of the YouTube channel. I am so grateful to be here. I'm happy to be back on. It's been a long time coming. And drop me a comment of who you would like me to interview next. What you can expect is to get the strategies and systems that I've used to scale my own coaching business to multiple millions per year using organic social media so hit that subscribe expect to see really great content coming soon and thank you so much and i will see you in the next video